The publisher primarily put it out there as an activity book looking at recreation in Greater Vancouver. My background is teaching outdoor recreation, um, but my background is also with a master's of environmental education. And my real reason for writing the book was to connect people to the natural world. And that's why when Nicole asked me, it really fit with this nature series because as you start to look at other way cool presentations and see presentations on different species, um, I'm not talking about any one species, but I'm talking about connecting with nature. And uh, uh, so it, it did fit quite well into the way cool series. My root, roots go back deep into Vancouver. Um, I grew up in Vancouver. I live in Port Moody now. But really, my history is roaming around Vancouver, Stanley Park, Pacific Spirit Park, Trout Lake, and uh, uh, connecting to the nature as, that, uh, as a child. And so when I think about um, the ins inspiring love of nature, um, I think I really I got it growing up in the city of Vancouver. The outline for tonight is going to look a little bit, or this afternoon rather, it's going to look a little bit like this. Um, I'm going to talk about a few activities in Vancouver, but I'm going to keep up light on the different activities. And I'm going to increase, being that we're here at the BB Biodiversity Museum, on the nature in these areas. So if I was talking to an outdoor recreation group, I would uh, uh, heavily talk about cycling and paddling and stand up paddle boarding and, mount, uh, and rock climbing, but in this case I'm going to focus more on biodiversity. I have um, one little uh, piece that I'd like to do on safety, and I have my backpack that has 10 essentials in it here, and then I want to uh, connect it with a little bit of a survey. The gentleman who just came in, I see you've got one there. Um, if you have a pen and paper and can write where your favorite place is to do activities in the spring and summer or the summer or fall, um, that would be great as well. well. Let's start then by saying when you're going to go to an activity outside, what do you do? When you're about to go, what do you need to know before you go? I had to think about this when I was writing the book. What kind of things come up? The weather? What's the weather going to do? Because I need to know how, uh, what my clothes are going to be. What else? How long the activity takes. Yeah, I'm going to be in there all day, and that might actually be connected to the weather and a storm front coming in. Did everybody notice the, yesterday the change in the weather? It was beautiful sunny in the afternoon. We went for a walk, and while we were out, it was all the clouds came over us just like that. It was very fast yesterday. Anything else? Transportation. You're going to want to know distances and elevations. You're going to want to look at time. And how do I get there? Am I going to get there by bike or by transit? Am I going to, um, how difficult is it going to be if I'm taking my mom with me? What's the train like? Is it going to um, be easy uh, on underfoot or is it going to be muddy? So you're going to be looking at all of these different types of things. This is one of the things I had to think about when I was putting a book together. And of course, all sorts of other things, whether you can bring dogs because people want to know about dogs or um, is there restrooms? I, honestly, the most common question I ever get from any of my students, any people that I ever take out is not how big this tree is, but where are the West restrooms <laughs> or, or how old the tree is. Um, what I'm finding, what I often find is people have to deal with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, those main physiological components before they can listen to you. And so that was the kind of stuff that I was thinking. So every activity, and this is an example of one of them, this is Lockside Trail going from, uh, on a bike from Swartz Bay to Victoria. It has all of that stuff, safety and timing and uh, things of interest and directions and highlights on the, uh, uh, on the activity. So I have a whole book with 49 things that has all of these in it. But why I'm here today and what I really want to go into is that I have an eco insight for every one of these. So it doesn't matter where you are, I try to ground you in the environment of the location that we're in. So, for example, how many of you put up your hands if you can identify with words like this? Journey, discover, any hands in these? Absorbing, 
growing, being curious, curiosity. On the one hand, you can see those nature words up top. On the second, you can see the activity portion of the book, being lively, being fit, being healthy. But how many of you do both? Like you need, in, in your mind, they go together. It's an extra, and that really goes together. That's, to me, what I love about being outdoors. I, I think I wouldn't enjoy the outdoors as much if I didn't enjoy the plants and the birds and the trees that are around me. So, with this said, let's see what we know about the outdoors. Does anybody know what the sound is coming from? What bird this sound is coming from? Stellar Stray. It's the picture on the screen. Yeah. That's the picture. So this is our BC provincial bird. And it comes in in August. It's eating blackberries right now. It's um, around town, you'll see it. And uh, it's one of the uh, common birds that we'll see here in the fall. In July, in June, July, this bird is singing and it's just stopped singing in the last one or two weeks. Anybody know what this one is? Sounds like a flute. Spotted tohi? No, good guess. Same size, actually. Same size as a spotted tohi. Thrush? It's, yeah, good job. It's a thrush, and it's called a Swainson thrush. Pretty drab looking, just kind of brown, little spots on the, on the front. But it's its song that is so absolutely beautiful, sounding like a, a flute in the forest. And often I tell people, sometime around 7 in the evening or 7, seven in the morning, you'll start to hear this thing start to, start to sing. But with that said, it came in on about May 29th this year, and I probably, the last time I heard it was about two weeks ago, and now it's found a mate, right? What if, why do birds call? They call to find a mate. So it's found a mate, it's found mates now, it's doing its thing, having eggs and, uh, and babies. And so you don't really see it calling, or hear it calling much anymore. Uh, so, um, let's extrapolate this now a little bit further, and in the appendix of the book, I have a page that looks like this, it's called a bioregional quiz, and again, like I said, I'm always trying to connect people in their environment. So, here's a couple questions from a bioregional qu quiz for you. Without looking, and we can't really right now anyway, do you know what stage the moon is at tonight in the sky? Does it appear to be getting bigger or smaller? And uh, anybody know what the moon's doing right now? It's been clear for the last few days. How many of you have looked at the sky in the last few nights? Who knows? What's the moon doing right now? Are we at full moon, new moon, somewhere in between? This is what I try to do in the book. When you're out and you're in Lynn Valley, or you're in Pacific Spirit Park, I'm trying to connect people to the world around them. That's why I'm asking this question. Well, it turns out, I Googled it just before getting in here today. <laughs> <laughs> it it's, was just a new moon. So, meaning there was no moon in the sky a couple days ago. And now it's waxing, it's getting a little bit bigger, and it's in the first quarter. And so we're just starting to get into a, a moon phase. And so if you're gonna look for the moon tonight, if it happens to be clear, look for it in the west. When it's waxing, when it's getting bigger, you'll find it in the west at sundown, right after the sun goes, sun goes down. So we'll watch, watch for that tonight. Question number two for you. Where does your tap water come from at home before it reaches your tap? Anybody know where your tap water comes from? Go ahead. Cleveland Dam, okay, so behind Cleveland Dam is the Capilano Reservoir. You said the Seymour Reservoir. And that both of those are correct for the city of Vancouver. They almost mix them together, and now there's a tunnel that goes under the mountain that mixes them. Anybody else for, uh, anybody out toward the Fraser Valley, like where I am by Port Moody? So Coquitlam Reservoir would be the other one. Okay, now the follow-up question, okay, it's gone down the sink or down the toilet. And when we flush the toilet, where does your wastewater Go. Anybody know? Isn't there a plant that fixes it up? Absolutely. It yeah. The ocean? They, they clean it up. Uh, except for in Victoria, which oh, is I the know. bane of people yes. in Washington State, I tell you. Yeah, no. <laughs> they do not like that Victoria just flushes straight into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. But here, 
we have the Anasis Island Sewage Treatment Plant. So most of us, if you live in Vancouver, that's where our wastewater goes. And they fix it up, and then they send it out into the ocean after that. If you live on the North Shore, there's a Lionsgate Treatment Plant now on the North Shore as well. So my point is, I try to connect people to the world around them through e uh, Eco Insights. Let's do one more call and see if you can get this one. And then this is for kids too, because I think you're going to know this. Oh. Dee -dee 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 -dee. You, know, you know it, don't you? That's obvious. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a second one, the same bird. Yeah, you got black it. Black cap chickadee. Black cap chickadee. Well done. Like 5,000 of them at our house because we like feed them. You feed the <laughs> black cap chickadee. Yeah. Very good. So in terms of bioregionalism, you guys got it. You know? <laughs> but then again, you are at the Biodiversity Museum. So my guess is you might not be quite in this next piece, linking nature and health. Uh, the average North American, so this was done by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the US, says that year after year, and they do this survey every single year, that 92% of their of time of the of average North American is spent indoors. Then, of the remaining 8%, 6% of that is outdoors but in a car. And then the other is the 2% really gives you an a, a idea of how little time the average North American spends out time, out, outside. So this study is done every year, and it has for about the last 15 years by the EPA. There is, of course, an antidote, uh, antidote to the modern city life. This group knows it, or you wouldn't be at the BC Biodiversity Museum. It's called nature. I'm often trying to convince people that their brains, they're not tireless machines. They're fatigued, and one way that you get those brains to slow down is by helping them take in the natural surroundings. And when you do, you have physiological changes in blood pressure, in cortisol, stress levels decrease, and you uh, notice changes to the way that you feel. So, uh, question for the group. Put up your hands. If you think you do some of your best thinking outdoors, Look at this, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that, that's often the case. So in writing this book, I thought about that. I thought about where could people go to do good thinking outdoors? Where to go locally um, to not just improve your health, but improve your health in nature? The other question that goes to this is where you live. How important is it for you to have access to urban trails close to where you live? So let's just do a little something here. Instead of I'm going to ask you to put up your hands, I'm going to ask you to stand up if, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being it's the most important thing when I choose to buy a house or live in a place, um, outdoors is absolutely one of my first concerns. To one, which is not a concern at all. I have way more concerns. I want to be close to work. I want to be close to family. I want to be close to a good education, to a good school. I want to be close to Walmart, whatever. You, 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 yeah, you don't want to be close to that. Um, so where are you on that scale? So anybody here, would you vote at, say, let's say a four to five? Is there anybody who says that nature, being close to nature, is somewhere around a four or five? Stand up if you think. Don't be shy. But four or five, because they've got other things that are probably <laughs> got other good. Homes. Yeah, <laughs> five to six, six to seven. Okay, good. Thank you. Seven to eight, eight to nine, and then nine to ten. Very good. So the bulk was sort of in the seven, eight, nine region right here in this room. So when we locate ourselves where we're going to live, look at how important nature is to us where we're living. We're in the 789 category, which is probably pretty good if you're getting a, 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 um, 
a mark on a test, hey? And, you, and, we, and we give them the seven, eight, nine out of ten categories. So here's Pacific Spirit Park. This is the closest place to us. There's all the trails. We're somewhere right in, in this area. There's an ecological reserve here. And there's lots of trails around for people who live um, around this, this area. The other part is Metro Vancouver itself has a lot that's offered to people. It's all sort of Metro Vancouver parks, through the watersheds, Mount C the Seymour, Lower Seymour Conservation Reserve, municipal parks like Lighthouse Park, which is the municipality of West Vancouver, or BC parks, BC Provincial Park, Mount Seymour, or Cypress Mountain. So we have a plethora of natural areas near our homes. So it's worthwhile saying then that Lighthouse Park would be an, a good example of a place to go. And in the book, it's one of the things that I have uh, uh, talked about, one of the things that I've talked about being uh, making that region truly livable. Let's imagine that we're in Lighthouse Park. Why would we go to Lighthouse Park? What's there? Those of you, the what? Rock climbing. Yeah, oh, that's true, there is rock climbing. I forgot about that. Oyster catchers. Oh, very nice on the rocks. Oyster catchers, good birding mm -hmm. in Lighthouse Park. Black oyster catchers. Old growth forest. Old growth forests in Lighthouse Park. And that's actually where I wanted to get to here. So there's beautiful old growth Douglas fir trees, cedar trees, and even some hemlock trees. There was a fire many years ago in, in uh, a Lighthouse Park. So a lot of these are fire scarred trees. So I'm just going to quickly um, pass this thing around. But in doing so, I think I'm going to need to help here. Can I get the four of you to kind of stand up where you are? And then I'm going to come over. And I'm going to say that you're a tree. Let's oh, just shift down just a little bit. So you're, you're trees, and if you could put out your branches for trees. And I'm going to be a young tree in Lighthouse Park. And I'm going to be trying to grow and trying and trying to grow. And I'm having a tough time because what's happening? I don't have a lot of light. And in Lighthouse Park, where there was a fire, sometimes a fire will knock down a tree. So maybe you can sit down. And sometimes a windstorm? What else? What else might knock down a tree? Or knock down a branch? Lightning. Lightning? OK, so li lightning goes to fire. Wind? So how about, I'm going to, you, you get a branch knocked off. <laughs> and then maybe we maintain Lighthouse Park with people. And sometimes a tree is going to be dangerous as people walk through. So our, the municipality of West Vancouver comes in and, sorry, takes you out. <laughs> but now all of a sudden I have, I have light. And now I can start to grow. Pay attention to this. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pass this around. And if, if, if we can kind of pass around it to the groups, take a look at this tree ring. Uh, in 1809, this tree started, and I want you to look at where it was 125 years later, and then I want you to look at where it was 187, 184 years later at the end. Take a look and see an example of what this really, what I just demonstrated, what it looks like. So I'm going to pass that to you, pass it around. And I use a, an example like this in the book under an Eco Insight to say, Whenever we see a tree and the, and the uh, size of the tree looks like this, and that's, the, that's the, the width, the diameter of the tree, I think we don't know how old that tree is because we don't know what its history is. And when we look at this, you'll see what I mean. You can't tell what the history is because the history could have been four trees were all covering the tree, blocking the light in early, early days. So. Lighthouse Park would be an example where I put in an eco insight like that. And while you're on learning about the ecology, you're walking 46 kilometers, you're going to ocean viewpoints, looking at black oyster catchers. Maybe you're having a picnic there. Another one that I love in the North Shore is Cypress Falls. It's a, a quintessential temperate forest, big old growth cedars. Um, and uh, a place you could easily go actually in the winter in a rainy day and, and it's, it's stunning, it's lovely, yeah, but a lot of people don't know about it, it's uh, not well known. 
um, around Greater Vancouver. Okay. There is a term, a sort of a bigger term I'm going to bring up here, and it's called mycorrhizal, uh, mycorrhizal connections. And what I need is a couple volunteers. Maybe I could ask, would you do me a favor? Would you stand over here? And can I ask you to put your hand on, this is a Sitka spruce. We're going to say that there's a Sitka spruce on the side of the, of the bil uh, building here. And maybe, um, Heather, can I ask you to stand here? And I'm going to move this table a little closer. And we're going to say that there's a Douglas fir tree that's right here. And that's probably, if you put your hand there, Heather. And then the third one is here. Would you mind doing me a favor and coming up here and putting your hand on that? <coughs> and why I wanted people sitting towards the front and why I wanted people shifted over is because when we stretch out our hands, what I'd like to do is I'm, I'm going to try to make a connection here. I'm going to say that all three people here are the trees. So they're the, actually the roots of the trees and the Douglas fir and the Sitka spruce and the western red cedar, three very common trees around UBC here. You can find them all by walking out the door. But when we see trees, we usually see them at our height. We see them at our level. You know, I'm 5 foot 11. I see them at 5 foot 11. I don't often look up and think about the trees up there. And even less so, I don't look down and think about what's going on underground. So what I want to do is just think in this activity, what's going on underground? So if you are going to be a tree, you're going to have a root system that goes out from the tree, and then it continues out. And we're going to... Anybody ever see a tree that's gone over and you can see the roots coming off of it? This is what I want you to think about right now. That's what's going on here. And then we have another tree with another set of roots. And then we have another tree with another set of roots. And what I would like to do is if people could get up, just stand up from in your chairs, and I would like you to even just shift over a little bit. And I want to make a connection between all of these root systems. So I'm going to, I'm going to, your name is? Yeah. Russell. Russell. I'm going to touch Russell's hand and, and it's ben, Vincenzo. Vincenzo. Yeah. And keep going. And Link, Link, and you, you can just touch the tips of people's hands they as you go along. And the, oh yeah, you got to get Heather in. Okay, yeah. right now. So now I want you to pay attention. I'm going to just move out of this spot for a moment. If those are the roots of trees, what's this? What's going on? What's all this? You got it. This is fungi. Mm -hmm. There's fungus among us, people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You didn't know that. This is, this is fungus, and it's called mycorrhizal fungus. This is underground right now, all around UBC. And between all of the trees, and there's a, by the way, there's a woman here by the name of Suzanne Samard at UBC who's studied this, has a great TED Talk. Um, uh, look at Suzanne Samard TED Talk. But right now, we've got um, energy from the middle of the forest out here, and it's going out to Heather, it's going over to Russell, it's coming out to the side here, and you are transferring energy out to the trees. These trees would be two-thirds shorter if they didn't have this energy. So everybody drop your hands. If we cut this relationship, you would be two-thirds shorter. Do you want to kind of go down two-thirds? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really what would be happening. We would have nowhere near the height of the canopy that we have. So let's think about this. All of these, all this fungus is giving nutrients and water to trees. And then the fungus says, well, wait a sec. What do we get out of this? I mean, we want something here too. What can the trees give fungus underground that the fungus can't do it for itself? Energy. Energy in the form of sugar. photosynthesis mm -hmm. and sugars. Mm -hmm. Trees, you can stand up now, because this is a healthy forest. <laughs> trees make sugars through photosynthesis. They send them through their root system to the mycorrhizal fungi. Mm -hmm. And the fungi send water and nutrients to the trees. What's that relationship called? Symbiosis. Symbiotic relationship. It's a symbiosis. Mm -hmm. That happens all around us 
every day. It's, got, it's one of the most common systems in our forest to, for the forest to grow as big as they are. Okay, now you can go back to where your seat, seats were. There is one species that lives here in UBC, in the Pacific Spirit Park, that will come out tonight that helps make this system continue. Anybody want to get, guess what it is? A northern flying squirrel. Mm. Oh. So those are sound asleep right now, up in the canopy. They're around. Absolutely they're around. And tonight they will come down and they will dig on the forest floor for a food that's going to help this mycorrhizal relationship continue. Anybody know what that food is they're going to dig for? Got it! No. On the first try, well done. <laughs> truffles. There's truffles, aren't you? Yeah. Not so edible, not like in oh. Europe. The edible th for them. For these guys. But not so much for us. <laughs> uh, so those truffles are the spores. That is the fruiting body of this fungus that was just here. That's the fruiting body. And so they eat the fruiting body. They move to another place in the forest. They defecate, defecate somewhere else and spread the spores. That keeps our mycorrhizal relationships going. Unless, of course, they get eaten by a barred owl <laughs> <laughs> along the way. So um, another uh, key piece in the forest. Um, the book is set up into chapters where it's looking at different activities. So hiking is an example of one. Another uh, uh, chapter is on paddling. Because I was doing this in Vancouver today, I thought I would throw in a paddle. That's a local paddle. One of the beauties about uh, the paddle in English Bay and Fultz Creek is on the one hand, it's busy. There's lots of people down there. But on the other, you have so many things at, right at your, at your fingertips, <laughs> at your paddle tips um, when you're paddling. You've got Granville Island and Science World and um, Vanier Park in that area. There's a place not too far from Granville Island, in fact, you can paddle up for fish and chips. And so in the, <clears throat> when I was writing the book, I figured out what the name of that place was, where to go, because I remember doing it when I was on a date one time, Heather. <laughs> but not with Heather. <laughs> Way back when I was a kid. <laughs> and uh, we went down there and, uh, and, had, and paddled up for fish and chips. Lockside Trail. <clears throat> Certainly one of my favorites, this is on Vancouver Island, so you have to take the ferry to get there, but you don't have to bring your car on the ferry. You just bring your bike, you get off in Schwartz Bay, <coughs> and cycle 33 kilometers in one direction. Believe it or not, it's a flat trail to Victoria. <coughs> there is not many hills other than to go over overpasses um, on, that, on that cycle. And in the end, you get to Victoria, you say, 33 kilometers, that's enough, I'm going to have lunch in Victoria, I don't want to cycle anymore. You put your bike on the bus at the Parliament buildings, and you come back to Swartz Bay. And so you've done it a ride, you've gone, you've gone uh, to and from, and you can do that all in a day trip. Beautiful fall cycle, if any of you want to know what to do on a weekend this coming September. <clears throat> One other section of the book is called Picnic Activities, and an example would be Barnston Island. How many of you, put up your hands, if you've been to Barnston Island before? Put up your hands if you've heard of Barnston Island before. Okay, three, four people in the audience. Um, you go over the Portman Bridge, down 104th to the end till you hit the Fraser River, and there's a little ferry, and it's free, and it's just a cable ferry that goes back and forth across to uh, island, there's people who live on the island, they have farms on the island, but at the end there's a little tiny postage stamp of, called Metro Vancouver uh, Park called Barnston Island Regional Park, and there's picnic tables. I put this in as a place to go for picnic activities. So I have about seven or eight ideas of places for people to take a picnic and either ride your bike, you can go 10 kilometers around the island, or one kilometer to the park off the ferry, and you could walk it. And the idea is where can we go for active picnics where we don't necessarily need a car? Because I'm trying to give people alternatives. That's the healthy aspect, being out in nature. And then in it, 
I decided to do a couple pages where I would just do some ideas of uh, what to bring um, on a picnic. So there's an example of a me some menu items. But this is a good place to talk about hidden gems. Just the fact that three people, four people in this audience knew about Bartston Island. That's what I'm trying to do in this book, is I'm trying to give ideas of hidden gems in our communities. Could I hear of any hidden gems in your communities? Would there be any, anybody be willing to share of a place that is an absolute gem that you love to go to where you live? Okay, Barclay House. Yeah, it's yes. next to a Rhoda House Museum, between yeah. the two of them. Yeah, Heritage Homes. Heritage Greenery, yeah. and um, you can always pick up a coffee on the corner ah. <laughs> in winter when it's really chilly, right. and you sit in the park and drink your coffee. Isn't it nice to have things like that? Mm -hmm. the, the, they really are gems in our community. Anybody else? In West Vancouver, I heard somebody say White Lake before. In Burnaby, somebody said Fraser Foreshore. Both of those are probably things that a lot of us haven't heard of before, but when you're in a community, you get to know these little gems. Where we live, it's Admiralty Point, and so that's out at Belcara Park, and it's a 15, 20 minute walk down to Admiralty Point, and you have a little beach all, often all to yourself, because not a lot, a lot of people know about it, and you're right on the water looking out into Indian Arm. Any others before I move the slide on? Yes, you got one. Uh, well, it's not, it's like this tiny, really tiny trail, but it's called like Beach Creek Park. Uh -huh. And it's like really, really short, but there's like a creek beside it and sometimes there's salmon and crayfish and stuff. Okay. But, but it's really short. Right. It, but sometimes it doesn't matter if it's short because you might just be going to sit. It's like convenient though, because it's like right down the street. I think that's important. If you're gonna have a gem in your community, it has to be convenient, mm -hmm. right? It's gotta be convenient to get to. Mm -hmm. That's good. Good point, thank you. Picnics. One of the eco insights, and a whole chapter, in fact, is on picnics. But I thought, oh, what can I do to give a good eco insight for a picnic? And I thought, pollination. So I'm going to go through a few aspects of pollination, and you can tell me if you knew, you knew about this. So today, think about what we ate today. How many food items that we've eaten today came to us because of pollination? You want to try to figure this out? So think about what you had for breakfast and possibly for lunch. Yeah, so you've probably had two meals already today. Nope. Anybody eat? Put up your hands. Anybody eat fruit so far today? Yeah, pollination. Yep. Vegetables? Yep. Pollination. Anybody have nuts? Nope. Yeah, good. Beans? How about a spread derived from, say, chickpeas? That would be hummus. Yep. How about coffee? Oh, look at that. Chocolate? Early in the day, <laughs> juice, soya milk, you get the idea. A lot of things we've already had today came to us because of pollination. 35%, in fact, one out of every three bites we eat comes to us via pollination. So crops are dependent on pollinators. What are pollinators? What are the pollinators that we think of? Bees, right? We all come up with bees, but they're only one of many pollinators. Mm -hmm. What are other, what's that? Hummingbirds, Hummingbirds are Butterflies. pollinators. Butterflies are pollinators, as are the nighttime equivalent? Yeah, yeah, Moths. What else? Bats. Bats are pollinators. Insects are pollinators. So sometimes they're by day, sometimes they're by night. There's a whole suite of pollinators out there and one in three bites that we eat depend on pollinators. So the health of pollinators is extremely important and it's connected to the health of us. Make sense? It's really the best insurance for this is abundance and diversity of pollinators. You don't want to just have one pollinator, you want to have many. You want to have them by day and you want to have them by night. And what that means is when you have abundance and you have diversity, you have what's called resilience. Resilience is something we want our communities, our cities, as the climate changes, as um, uh, forests perhaps get cut, or oceans rise, we want resilience. And in terms of pollination, 
that is uh, a key piece. So I want to put out an idea here. Pollination is something called, we call an ecological service. How many of you have heard the term ecological services before? So about half this group. So ecological services are things that nature does for us without any cost to us. If we were to lose pollinators, so bees right now are having a problem, and what's the name of, that, uh, of the issue that's happening around bees? It's called? Okay, neo neonics, which is a type of pesticide or herbicide, um, is causing problems with, with bees. Um, but there's something called colony collapse disorder. And if we were to lose bees, of which we've lost a lot here on the west coast of British Columbia, we would end up losing a portion of an ecological service that we rely on. And it was provided for us for free. In China, there are many people, because they've lost that ecological service, they go out and pollinate by hand their own fruit trees. How sad would that be to not have the pollinators do it for us for free? So um, our role, of course, is to think about the range of life support services and, um, and what it is that we get from them. And with that said, oh, there's a difference, sorry, I forgot to push my slide when I got into that. Um, with that said, how many of you are wearing cotton right now? Yeah, that's been pollinated too. Okay, there's another part of the book that I thought was important. I didn't want to send people into nature, learning about nature without being safe in doing so. So, what are, I, I created something called 10 Essentials. I went on the North Shore Search and Rescue website when I was writing the book, and I wanted to know what the experts in the North Shore Search and Rescue would uh, call the safety items. Anybody know what are things that you absolutely want to carry with you when you go in uh, to, uh, on a hike or uh, into nature? Bug spray? Bug spray. So it's not in the top 10 <laughs> because it's an inconvenience to be bit by a bug, but it's not essential to be uh, being safe outdoors. Unless, sunscreen. of course, uh, sunscreen. So it could be sunglasses, sunscreen, some way so you don't get burned. Excellent. Water. We can last so many days without food, but not many days with water. I don't remember exactly what the numbers are, but isn't it something like three days without water? Yeah. So water, having an extra water bottle is absolutely essential. Um, you said something else. Uh, uh, Neosporin or Band-Aids? Okay, I'm going to just go right back to a first aid kit. So a, a, a first aid kit and then knowing how to use the things in the first aid kit. <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah, so food and snacks, but also extra. Mm -hmm. So you'll probably carry food and snacks because you know you might be out for four or five hours, but you want a little extra something because of the, you know, being lost or, or it's for the emergency aspect. So a little bit more. Rain gear. Rain gear. So the number one item didn't come up yet. So rain, rain gear or, or clothing, appropriate warm or rain clothing is important because you don't want to get hypothermia. Oh, shelter. Shelter. Like yep. Flashlight. There we go. Number one item, flashlight. A flashlight is key when you are out, outside. So here's a list. And flashlight, headlamps, oh, yes. TVs, extra food, water, warm, waterproof clothing, first aid kit, pocket knife. Oh, we didn't come up with fire in this group. Some way to keep warm. So just a lighter um, or, or matches. A signal, some way to let others know um, where you are if they're looking for you. There's your uh, shelter, emergency shelter. Map, compass, or uh, communication rather, my cell phone, and maybe things like a puffer if you have to take medication or glasses if you don't see well. This, all of that is in here for both Heather and I when we go. So this is for two people and it's in that size of a pack. So when I finish this presentation today, if anybody wants to see what all of this looks like, most of these things actually are in one Ziploc bag that are that's that big. So it's really quite tiny. But I have extra clothing, warm gear, I have a down jacket in here, I've got rain gear, um, all of that. 
I have binoculars. I, uh, in this case, I took my books out, but I'm always carrying kind of bird books and stuff. Flat books along with me as well. So, how about we take a look at what your summer calendar looks like? Maybe summer, fall now, as we get into August. Can I collect some of these? Can we pass some of these things forward? Maybe pass these with the pens, and I'll just collect these. Because I would like to keep here. And is everybody okay if I read these out? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is this going to be local? I was hoping you were going to do something with me. Oh. <laughs> because it would give us ideas of where to go to. Thank you, Nicole. And we have one more being done here. Anybody else ready to pass anything out? Okay. I'll, I'll Thank you. I'll take that. Thanks. All right. Um, here in Vancouver, this is probably going to be pretty Vancouver centric. Stanley Park. Um, Walk to see the beavers along the Beaver Lake Trail. Absolutely. Uh, fascinating uh, place to go. Did you know that Beaver Lake is slowly filling in? And so there's a lot of talk. Do we let it naturally fill in? Which probably isn't so natural because we do a lot of things to, to, to Stanley Park. Um, or do we dredge it and try to keep it so it's open? It's a debate that happens in the Vancouver Parks Board as to what they do with Beaver Lake. Um, Looking for birds, skunks, coyotes, raccoons, easy to do in Stanley Park. All of those things can be seen right around Lost Lake, in fact. A Pit Lake canoe. I've got to tell you, on last Saturday, we went out to Pit Lake to go do a canoe. Couldn't do it. <laughs> we had a boat with us, and the wind picked up in the afternoon, and there were white caps on the water, and there was no way I was going to do that crossing. We were going to do that crossing to go over to Widgeon Creek. Um, so we tried to do that, actually, last week. First time I, could, I tried in 10 years and uh, couldn't do it, so that's still on my list too. A Tri-City hike to the Avistas Trail in Bunsen Lake, the high point in Bunsen Lake, beautiful ridge, and it takes you along looking at um, Indian Arm from Diaz Vistas. Anybody want to guess how many views are up there? Thank Speak you. Spanish? <laughs> yes? Ken. Uh, Pit Lake canoeing, White Cliff, uh, uh, White Cliff Park for photography. Um, another fantastic place. Who put White Cliff Park on here? So I have White Cliff Park in the book, and uh, for me, I put it in under a picnic place because mm -hmm. I just see it. When that tide is out, you can get out to that extra rock that's a little uh -huh. further out, you know, that's covered when the tide's in. Mm -hmm. Fantastic place for a picnic, as long as the tide's not coming in while you're <laughs> sitting out there, I guess, <laughs> now that I think about it. Um, uh, Lynn Canyon. So we just had family members here last week. In a minute, I'm gonna, I think on my next slide, I talk about bringing companions. How many of you take visitors from, to Vancouver, to Lynn Canyon, to go to the Lynn Canyon Suspension Bridge? I grew up like that. My dad would always take family members or anybody who was visiting to Lynn Canyon. Grouse grind to climb the stairs. Um, how many feet is the grouse grind? How much climbing are you doing? Two kilometers and then elevation about 2,000 feet, right? Or yeah. Wait, what are, how do you measure? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're meters, aren't you? Oh my goodness. I, you'd think because I live in Canada, I should be able to do that. So we're about, uh, we were sitting at about 700 meters. It's three, three feet, three inches. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, three feet, three inches to one meter. So if you just multiply by 3.3. .3. Lighthouse Park, Cypress Falls, Azalty Point. Somebody put this in. Did you put that in after I talked about it? Who put that in? Or did you, did you yeah, put it before? Yeah, I was just taking notes. Okay, so I'm going to give that back to you because you're going to need that. Thank notes. you, yes. <laughs> uh, Spanish banks. When I talked about my roots here in Vancouver, my roots in Vancouver, when I think about what inspires me with nature, Spanish banks, Jericho, absolutely part of my childhood. And the fact that I love nature today, I credit places like that. Uh, Squamish for hiking, including Garibaldi Park and backcountry camping. Who, do, who wrote that one? The first place I took Heather when I met her was to backpack up to Garibaldi. Like that to me is you go to Battleship Islands and Garibaldi Lake, right? And uh, so you and I have a similar love of that uh, area. And if somebody didn't like doing hills, you go in Chequemus. It's Chequemus, is yeah. so Chequemus Lake is flat. And so that's uh, another one. Pacific Spirit Park for biking. 
the aquarium, Stanley Park, and watching a 4D movie. Who did the 4D movie? Way to go, <laughs> both of you. <laughs> Sunshine Coast for cycling. Is there a good, do you do Sunshine Coast? Is there a good cycling trail in Sunshine Coast or on the road? Okay, so do you go over with a vehicle and uh, then I cycle? Or you can cycle to the ferry and then take the ferry over to by seashells. Right, in fact, you can take a bus mm -hmm. into seashells, right? Yeah. And then down to Porpoise Bay from there. So anybody who likes cycling, think about the Sunshine Coast as a place to go. So close. And Stanley Park, you wrote Stanley Park, didn't you, for hiking. So um, good, good uh, overview uh, in this group. If anybody wants your your uh, pieces back for notes, um, let me know. Uh, when I'm out in any of those places, I should just maybe quickly mention, I often will have a, a, a plant book um, or a bird book with me. And because I know a lot of my plants in the local area and birds in the local area, I often actually don't bring these out anymore because I know what it is I'm seeing. But if I'm going, say, to the Okanagan or to the Kootenays um, or down in Washington State, I may bring something like this with me because I know I'm gonna see things that I'm not used to seeing. Um, if you're looking for a good um, plant book, the Pojar McKinnon plant book, you can see this has been well used, fantastic. I'm sure you've probably had Annie McKinnon or Jim Pojar speak here before, hey? And then this is brand new. I just saw this at Costco the other day and I've got all sorts of bird books on my shelf, but Heather told me I could buy another one. <laughs> I've done all the other bird books I have. And so I spent another 18 bucks on a new bird book by uh, uh, Dick Cannings. And uh, if you haven't seen it, it's beautiful inside and it's local to British Columbia. And it's, it's comprehensive and that's important for me. I want something that's comprehensive and not too light. Dick Cannings used to actually be the curator of our tetrapod collection. Very good. And now he's a, uh, was, was that Dick or Stick? That was, Dick was the curator? Dick is Okay. And, and now he's an MP in the Okanagan. Okay, I gotta move on here. Um, uh, in Greater Vancouver, I really should have had this as the backdrop when I was reading out what everybody um, had here. But look at this. Go from Golden Ears Park to Burke Pinecone Burke, Indian Arm, Mount Seymour, the Seymour Conservation Reserve, the watersheds, Lynn Headwaters, and Cypress. Look at all that green space north of Vancouver that's preserved. Not many places in the world have that kind of green space around a city of 2.2 million people. We are absolutely blessed. You've got the Catskill Mountains, don't you? And, and that's where your water comes from too, if I remember right. Um, very cool. Uh, or as you move south, Burns Bog, Pacific Spirit Park, Surrey Bend, all sorts of different ones as well. Think about companions to bring with you on your walks or cycle or nature excursions. Um, think about children. There are not, and you might not be one of them, there are not enough children who get outside today and explore nature, especially city children. You want to evoke their sense of wonder. You want to help them explore. When you're going outside, think, is there anybody in my community that have children that would go out and enjoy this nature with me? Think teenagers, any teenagers for a challenge. So in the book I wrote on the Stuamas Chief as an example, that's a great one to bring a teenager. They might scowl going up, but when they get to the top, you're gonna see they feel pretty proud when they're at the top of the Stuamas Chief. Older adults can do many of the beautiful areas and so on in the appendix. I had I've made a connection with bringing children, teenagers, older adults, visitors, and what activities would be best that would suit those people. And uh, so somebody like the Grouse Grind that we wrote, if you have an active visitor, they would probably love to do the Grouse Grind, right? Even as busy as, busy as it is, uh, just as Lynn Canyon. So think about companions. Um, and who to bring out, whether it be visitors or even dogs. Um, so in the end, um, I want people to understand that there's definitely a nature health linkage 
and that the two go together. Our recreational activities and nature go together, that there's many different kinds of things that you can do outdoors. And so I've got a dozen ideas in here, um, but 49 different activities to suit. Uh, always think about the eco side of what it is that surrounds you in the environment. I know when I travel, that's really what often pulls me into an area. Um, don't hesitate to think of safety.